This is the second part of a multi-part series on the Spanish Civil War. If you have missed the previous parts in the series, I will leave a link to those in the description so that you can watch them too. With that said, enjoy. With Alfonso XIII gone, the Second Republic of Spain was founded on April of 1931, with a new flag for the country. Interestingly enough, this would be one of the few flags in history to use purple. Alcala Zamora, a landowner for the head of the provisional government, was the head of the state before general elections could take place to fully establish the leadership of the new republic. However, almost immediately, complex problems began to present themselves. To begin, there was the mammoth task of modernising a nation that was far behind. This meant providing an effective public education system, a task that was easier said than done given the high rate of illiteracy. There was also the need for massive agrarian and land reform which was a strong demand of many voters. This too was a complex issue to solve, as a system of hierarchy that existed on the fields had been entrenched over centuries and would require precision or care to handle else reactionary forces such as landowners and the church would create a backlash. On top of this, there were several factors acting against them. The most notable of these were the financial effects of the Great Depression, which while not affecting Spain as badly as the rest of Europe given its isolation, the effects were negative nonetheless. Furthermore, there were the consequences of Primo's reckless spending that had left the nation in a large amount of debt. And if that was not enough, there was the fact that investors, both foreign and domestic, had become unwilling to lend money as they feared that the land reform the Republic was embarking on would compromise property rights and therefore make the economy unstable to bet on. And finally, there was the question of independence movements in the Basque regions and especially Catalonia, which had been gaining popularity in recent years. Now, the separatist movements are a long, complex issue which deserve its own video in the future, but for context, the Basques and Catalonians are a unique people of Spain who speak a different language, and who have a unique culture that go all the way back to the Middle Ages during the Reconquest. To this day, many Catalonians see themselves as separate to the Spanish and ardently wish for autonomy, However, many centralists in the Republic saw any compromise with separatism as a threat to unity. Not to mention, many Catalonians were also radical leftists, and the region was a hotbed for anarchism, which meant that the Republican government would have to tread very carefully to keep control of the situation. In spite of these obstacles, Zamora pressed forward with holding elections in June, and began to draft a new constitution for the government. The creation of the constitution was riddled and furiously debated. The clause that became the most contentious was Article 44, which allowed for the expropriation of land without compensation. This was greatly supported by the socialists, but Zamora was highly reluctant, knowing the peril that land redistribution could entail. Nevertheless, the constitution was voted through in December, and Zamora was elected president, and Manuel Azaña, a colleague of his, was elected prime minister. One particular clause that generated controversy was the one for separation between church and state, which greatly angered the Catholic Church. Spanish cardinals began to denounce the Republic, stating that without Catholicism, Spain would be nothing. Indeed, the stakes for the Spanish Church were high, as much of its revenue came from government subsidies. In response to this, many radical groups began to wage a war against the cardinals in a series of church burnings, where they would be looted and destroyed. Anti-clericalism, as it was called, became a widespread phenomenon throughout the 30s, and many believed the church to be an oppressive and corrupt institution that was a relic of the monarchy. This had the effect of making the religious of Spain increasingly resentful of the left. In fact, the period between 1931 and 33 were marked by considerable unrest and violence by many radical groups, not to mention the anarchists, who regularly attacked the police and organised peasant riots. The anarchists, who were union syndicalists under the banner of the Comunal Nacional de Trabajo, or the CNT, were not afraid of using violence, as they thought that even the Liberal Republic was an obstacle to their goals. The Civil Guard, who were the military police, had a difficult time controlling it. This was exemplified in 1933 during a shootout between anarchists and the police in the province of Cadiz, killing 25. The government was greatly criticised for its brutality. Additionally, there was an attempted coup d'etat by General Sanjurjo. The conspiracy was defeated, however, it was a clear sign that the Republic was not governing a stable regime. General discontent would force Manuel Azaña to step down. 
Elections would take place in November of 1933 and would be won by the Conservative coalition headed by Alejandro Lerdo. This, however, had the effect of radicalizing many amongst the left, especially the socialists who felt disillusioned. A radical communist known as Largo Caballero began to gather more and more relevance as his rhetoric and revolution began to resonate with the socialists. This was not helped when the conservatives began to end land and social reforms. Things went awry again in October of 1934 when a massive strike of up to 30,000 workers occurred in the north. The movement quickly became violent with the communist organizers behind the uprising intending to replicate the events of the 1917 Russian Revolution. The revolt, primarily led by miners, temporarily occupied dozens of towns and a few cities. It took a few weeks for the military intervention led by none other than Franco to put the insurrection down, and up to a thousand people died in the chaos. The Asturias Rising, as it became to be known, left an impression amongst the right that the nation was under siege by communists. A year later, Lero's government and his alliance of conservative forces collapsed due to various scandals, such as his gambling and embezzlement. After his resignation, new elections would be announced for February of 1936. The organisers may not have known it at the time, but these would be the last public elections to be held in Spain until the 70s. While preparing for the upcoming election, both the left and right had incredible angst and were convinced that if their opponents won, they would surely plunge the country into the worst possible thing that they could imagine, be that a socialist crap hole or a genocidal fascist regime. Spanish politics had become unimaginably polarised and the stakes could not be higher. The right, which included the monarchists, ultra-conservative Carlists, landowners, clergy and the fascist Falange, a far-right group who modelled themselves after Mussolini and his thugs, began to ally and form the Theta, a right-wing coalition. Meanwhile, the left, who were composed of the Republican liberals, various socialist parties, Catalan and Basque separatists and the syndicalists, joined to form the Popular Front. The Popular Front, while composed of many competing factions, was ultimately a more unified bloc, and because of the nature of the electoral system, they were able to win by a thin margin. The reaction from the right was one of outrage, but also one of great fear, with the Catholic Church believing that the Bolsheviks themselves had seized power. These concerns were not relieved when workers began to demand unrealistically high wages, and when communists rushed to prisons to release their comrades, believing that the new republic would allow them to do so. The situation was made abysmal by the fact that bad economic times had fallen on Spain that year. The new government's promise for land and economic reform had frightened away investors and depleted the confidence of the peseta. On top of this, there would be a wave of strikes by workers who were confident that the new government would cave in to their demands. Seeing no other course of action, far-right groups such as the Falange and the Carlists began arming and attacking left-wingers with the intent to remove what they called the Bolshevik infiltration of Spain. In response, left-wing groups took up arms to defend themselves and were all around the country. Cities descended into a messy round of violence. The country had been completely paralysed by quasi-civil war. It was around this time when Generals Franco and Sanjurjo, along with Duke Emilio Mola, began plotting what they believed would be the only way to save their country from a communist takeover. The Republican government, suspecting such a plot, decided to have them move to the fringes of the country where they could not cause any trouble. However, their plotting continued. Even so, many figures in the Republic were convinced that there was no threat of a military uprising. In July of that year, conservative politician Calvo Sotelo was assassinated by a left-wing militia. One could argue that this would be the last straw for the right, and the coup which the Falange had been secretly preparing for months was given the go-ahead. Only hours later, army garrisons in Morocco revolted under their general's command, with the intent to head to the mainland and take the country.